Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Prep Life Podcast. This is your founder and CEO of Glam Girl Bikini, Amy Anger. And today I'm joined by my fabulous co-host. Hi, everyone. I'm Lee Marie Hassetter, Glam Girl Bikini Coach. Yeah. And we are going to be talking about just in general, what are some good coaching practices? I know a lot of people will point out like, what are red flags? Um, But I like to kind of talk about like, what are the green flags? Like, what are some qualities that make a coach really good. And we specifically want to talk about our niche online um, because that's a different animal when it comes to, because you, you coach people in person and that is going to have, it's going to look like a different type of style, um, you know, in some ways uh, when you're an online coach. So I wanted to just kind of go through some of the things that we think are are good qualities um, to look for in a good online coach and some good practices. So I'll start with the first one. And they just take time to understand your current circumstances and your needs as well as your past. And they are respectful of your insight. So it's a collaborative approach, um, approach versus just kind of like do what I say because I'm saying this, that – cliche that's I think terrible is like trust the process um there needs to be reasons why and I I want my athletes to ask me questions because that shows they're invested and that's going to empower them to you know run with their decisions and um make them strive for their goals more if they are asking questions so I always want to make it a non-combative like um you know zero entry like them, they should not feel threatened at all by um, asking me a question because as their coach, I should know the answer. If I do something, there should be a reason why. Sometimes I don't always have the time to explain every single thing. I try my best to, but um, yeah, I, I welcome questions as they come. What are your thoughts? Anything to expand on that? Yeah, absolutely. I think a really good green flag is that they educate you and they make sure you understand why are you doing what you're doing? I think as an athlete, if I know the purpose of why I'm doing it and why you made a little change, especially in our sport, there are a lot of methods that work on different bodies to to basically achieve the same result because we're all looking to bring our best package for stage, but we all have different bodies, different metabolisms, different shapes. There are different ways of prep, different ways of peaking, different ways of you know t- getting an athlete to stage. And so if I know why in particular my coach is having me do some little thing that I don't really understand because it might be different than someone else's, then I'm going to do it with a lot more um, just confidence and I'm going to be consistent with it. I'm actually going to follow through because I know this is why I'm doing it. So that I think that's really helpful to make sure that your, your athletes are educated. They know why they're doing what they're doing. And that they do always feel comfortable to come with you, you know, with questions, you know, not just going to shut them down and be like, Hey, this is how we do things that works. Trust me. Yeah. And input too, because they know their bodies best. And especially if they're an experienced athlete that has been coached by other people, they know, you know, some things have worked for them. Some things haven't. And even just for every athlete, even if I've had an athlete for like seven years, which I have like their preps change from each one to the next, you know, and things build off of different situations and things. So I just think it's important for the body, for the athlete to tell the coach what their body is feeling, because we don't know that part of it, you know, Um, things might not feel right to them. And so it's good to get their input. And I usually, another step that I take to just have them get that buy-in and empowerment is I will give them two options. You know, Mm -hmm. a lot of times I'll say, you know, right now in this season, I'm like, we need to get a little bit more aggressive on the deficit. Would you rather a calorie cut or would you rather more movement? And depending on what their life is like, you know, like if they just got a new job, then they're like, I cannot do any more exercise. I cannot do more movement, but I can definitely lower my calories because that won't take up my time. So I just think like including them in decisions, if it's, if it's one way or another, like you're going to be creating a deficit, you know, why not ask them for their opinion? Again, they're going to feel empowered making that decision and having some buy-in on, on their prep. Absolutely. In my opinion. 
Yeah. I think that leads really good into the next green flag, which is demonstrates a good coach demonstrates personal touch and care in programs and in feedback for making it clear that it's not cookie cutter. So it's individual. They can make adjustments and modifications according to feedback, answer questions according to what the athlete shares with them. So one of the things with Glam Girl that we talk about is our unicorn preps. And I think it's really important to have a coach that will see you as an individual athlete, build a program around where you're starting, where the end goal is, and your own lifestyle asks lots of questions about your job and your time management and your kids and all of those things, your food preferences, things like that, and will make adjustments according to your feedback. What do you think about that? Absolutely. 100%. Yeah. I mean, when I built this company, that was the main thing that I wanted to find is like, I've, you know, I've been doing this for, you know, almost 14 years now. And it's like, there's just so many instances where, you know, I just wanted something more. And like, I wanted the person to kind of get to know me and understand where I'm coming from and design the programming on that. And, you know, I've had great coaches that have done that, but I've also in the past, like I've had people that just give me like, a, it was very obvious. I went to a camp and a five foot girl and I'm five, seven had the exact same lunch as me to the like slices of apple. Um, it was the exact same meal. And it just became very obvious to me that everyone was getting this meal plan. And that really like, that just breaks your heart. Like that, you know, my metabolism and my lifestyle, like just my metabolism alone, like for my height mm -hmm. is way different than this other individual. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, yeah, I just think that it needs to be customized. They need to take into account the holistic approach to mm -hmm. the athlete and looking out for their best health and everything. So, um, as far as the health of the athlete, I wanted to talk about, um, one of the green flags that we had, you know, as one of our, our flagged good practices, um, allow a variety of food in their program as well as flexibility without sacrificing health performance and physique goals. So I think it's important to, to like consider their, um, like their mentality, like where they're at with the relationship with food, you know, do they need just macros? Do they need, you know, meal suggestions? Everyone's coming to you at a different spot. So, you know, if I'm talking to somebody that's never been on any kind of program at all, I'm going to probably really overwhelm them with just giving them some macro numbers because they're not going to know where to start. Mm -hmm. um, so they need a little bit more guidance, maybe in a meal exchange, include the macros and then start introducing that as they get comfortable with just, you know, being on some sort of like quote unquote diet, you mm -hmm. know what I mean? Absolutely. Um, yeah. And then also just making sure you have like hard and fast rules where, I mean, for me, I don't, allow an athlete to really go under 1200 calories for any extended period of time. I mean, that's just a non-negotiable, um, and you know, fats as well. Like there's just a very short amount of time where I'll go under 40 grams, things like that, just to keep like the athlete's health in the forefront. And it, you shouldn't have to go that low if you've planned out the prep long enough and you're not doing anything extreme. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think that's where you can, as long as you're the athletes okay with, you know, giving yourself enough time to actually do a healthy prep where your body's not going to have to go to these extreme measures. Um, so what are your thoughts on yeah, that? Yeah, absolutely. And then just the variety of foods as well, like keeping, yes. especially if you have an athlete that is just overwhelmed with macros and they just want a meal plan um, or a meal exchange giving them options, not overwhelming them, but giving them enough options so that they can have a variety. And then sometimes when I get feedback from an athlete that has to do with digestion or hunger or, you know, certain things, or they just have a super drastic change in their measurements week to week, I'll go back and I'll check their food diary, which is what, um, why it's so handy to have them track as well as follow a meal plan. Um, and just see, hey, have they been eating, you know, too many processed foods like protein bars or protein shakes? Could we replace that with whole foods or have they been eating the exact same protein sources every single day? Maybe we need to bring in more variety or maybe we just, you know, they need a new nutrition plan like every four weeks. 
if we're not making changes like say every week in a prep. So I think just making sure that they get a variety of nutrients and that we have access to know what they're eating is really important too. Yeah. And just to kind of, I guess, go into more depth than what you were saying, like with the processed foods, not that there's anything wrong with those, but like if they are feeling hungry, Mm -hmm. those are really fast digesting. So that really like helps them in that sense. Um, And then, like you said, if they're having poor digestion, you know, thinking about how much fiber they have and just overall gut health in general, just having a variety of, you know, fruits, vegetables, things like that. Yeah. Even convenient foods. I know I've had a client that kept, I kept getting feedback that she was starving and her calories were actually pretty high. And and I was, it was in comparison. I mean, she's tall, but I was comparing them to my macros and I was like, wow, if I was eating that much food, I would be, I would be satisfied. So I went and I looked in her diary and she had a lot of prepared meals that she was buying for convenience. And a lot of those sauces and extra things she could hit her macros, but she was eating like two meals and a snack and hitting her macros. And it was like, if you replace these with whole foods that you cook yourself, you're going to be so much more like full and satisfied throughout the day because you're going to just be eating more. And she did like insane the difference, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. Like if something's really high fat, like a protein that's in those pre-made meals, Mm -hmm. you hit your fat goal, you go over your budget real fast. Oh, yeah. Um, So another one that we feel like is a good practice is just getting back to people in a timely manner and making sure we communicate um, and getting back to them. So my rule of thumb, and this is kind of like the precedent that I have for all of our staff is just that within 24 hours, as long as it's a business day. So there's delay over the weekend, you know, because we're we're people too, and we need to have our boundaries um, for our mental health so that we're the best coaches possible. But 24 hours um, response time, and you know, usually it's it's faster than that. But um, but yeah, like if somebody checks in and they did it in a timely manner when they were supposed to before the like the deadline of when, you know, because we we let we lay all of that out. You know, we we tell them our athletes, like what day they're checking in, what time it needs to be submitted if they want an immediate response. So it's kind of on them too. Like it's a two way street um, and getting stuff to us in a timely manner as well. Cause I'm one of those coaches that I'll just match your efforts. And so, um, but if you have a question, I'm always going to get back to you within 24 hours. And I always tell, I mean, I tell clients too, like if it's an emergency where they need an immediate answer and they know it's a Saturday or a Sunday, then I'll let them text me. But for the most part, we, we just communicate through the portal. Then all of our information that we've communicated is just all in one place. And then we have kind of record of like what we said to them. And, um, so then everybody kind of, you know, keeps it there and it notifies us as coaches, which is nice as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think laying out expectations is really good too. Like I've, I've kind of explained, and this goes back to explaining the why to a couple of my clients where it's like, I do have this deadline where you need to check in on this day by this time. And when you submit your check-ins late, sometimes I don't like, it doesn't fit in with my schedule to get back to you on that same day. So if you you submit it late, it might be the next day that you get your feedback in. And I want you to know that I'm not uh, sort of like, trying to be petty or pay you back for checking in late. It's just that I have this, this time set aside. So if you check in on time, I'm going to get back to you and just kind of laying out and explaining those parameters before you start so that we both know our expectations. I think that's really important. And then also, yeah, I do allow a little more access to me to athletes as well that are getting really close to a show. Because I know that there are some, especially if it's a newer athlete, there are questions that are going to come up during the week or an immediate thing or something. And it's like, I, I want to be there for you. And I feel like my, my, my coaching gets a little more hands-on as the time comes for the show. And then obviously peak week, we're just constant communication show day. We're coaching them all day, whether it's in person or online. So I definitely think there's, there's like an ebb and flow with that, but yeah, for sure. Getting back to them in a timely manner is super important. Yeah. Yeah. And I'll, I mean, if I have an athlete on stage that I'm coaching long distance, they just know that they have that I'm basically on call. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that whole weekend, if they need something from me, they know they can text me, but we've already set that expectation to start. And, um, you know, when people text me, I feel bad because like it gets lost in my feed or, 
you know, I think of text as like an emergency, like situation where I'll just give like a curt answer, like, not that I'm trying to be like a jerk or anything, but like, I just want to give them a quick answer, right? Because that's how I view text. But if you give me a message in the portal, then I'm going to give you a very like thorough look. I'm going to be able to see it on my laptop. I can see your pictures or whatever it is that you have a question about. I'll probably send you a video in response to it. Mm-hmm. You'll get to hear my voice and I'll have a thoughtful answer because I'll ha- I'll have had that time set aside to, you know, love up on them. Because like, usually if I get a text, I'm distracted doing something else just because you know, I have certain time blocks for everything that I'm doing throughout my day. So yeah. I think that's, um, I think that leads into another really good um, green flag. You mentioned having their pictures, having all their check-ins on there. I think a good green flag is they track data outside of just weight. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, we can look back on your check-ins. We can look back on measurements. We can look back on pictures. We can even look back on your scans. If you take scans with us and things like that, I think it's really mm-hmm. important. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I just, that's why when I built the portal, like for Glam Girl, I included things like hormone status, uh, sleep, digestion, um, mental state, because stress, cortisol can have weight up, your bowels not moving can have weight up, your period can have weight up. So we need to know as coaches, like all these other factors that are happening that might change those variables. So when I'm looking at it, you know, I'm also asking about inches and I'm asking for pictures. So I can usually tell like from someone's picture also, if they've had progress, like maybe they started their period, but like I can see, you know, certain things or like if they're in improvement season and like their inches are going down, but their weight's going up, you know, I can tell by the inches that your body fat is going down and your muscle is going up if your weight's going up and your inches are going down. So I just think that there's way more to, first of all, that person's worth, like their worth should never be tied up into to weight. It should just be a data point. But I also think like when you are in a contest prep, like you are thinking, okay, I need to be losing weight every week, but sometimes that doesn't happen. So we just need the whole picture as a coach to, to like, you know, not like punish you because like, okay, you had your period. Like I've had that before, like literally with, um, coaches, they'll see my weights up and everything. And my weight goes up by like five pounds and they never asked if I was on my period, you know, and they'll make an adjustment like based on like, Oh, she must've cheated on her diet or something. I'm like, no, like you didn't, you didn't ask me all the other questions or maybe I was constipated for three days. And so I had three extra pounds of poop in my body. You know what I mean? So, yeah. I mean, that can affect your measurements. All of that can affect your measurements. Absolutely. Yeah. Which is over time, like, I used to just like get just the pictures, the weight, and the measurements when I used to do it via email. And then I found myself asking all of those questions that are in the portal on our check ins. And I'm like, okay, I need to save myself some time, ask all these questions. Then, if I have further questions after that, then I can prompt those because. I always feel like if you can't get to the bottom of something, you can't find a solution. You haven't asked enough questions when it comes to coaching. You can never ask enough questions. Uh Uh-huh. I love that. That's so good. So then (laughs) speaking of communication, (laughs) another green flag is they communicate when you may need to push or pull back and they're willing to be honest with your feedback. So Absolutely. When when is it time for a little tough love versus mm-hmm. when is it time to talk someone off the ledge? I feel like as coaching, when I get check-ins in, most of the time I'm talking someone off the ledge saying, hey, mm-hmm. let's, let's look at your data. You actually made incredible progress. Like, okay, maybe your weight didn't drop more than half a pound, but you look at all your measurements. Look at this, look at that. So I think the majority of the time I'm talking them off the ledge, but then sometimes it's like, hey, it's been, you know, three weeks where you have had like, you know, you went off plan or you've been this or you've done that. Like we need some tough love, you know, we need to go back yeah. to your why we need to go back to what it takes to be in the sport, you know? So I think there is that balance of knowing your athlete, knowing when they need to be pushed or pulled back too. Yeah. 
And just having that initial conversation, I think whether they're a new athlete that's kind of interviewing me to um, for me to become their coach, that's the reason why I talk to them about like what is an appropriate stage weight. I have them send me their pictures and I get their measurements and their weight and their height. So I know like where they probably need to be weight wise and what we need to calculate for a pound a week to be how many weeks out and making that realistic. And usually if you set that expectation from the very first phone call and everyone's on the same page with getting there, then it's really easy to refer back to like you mentioned that you wanted to be competitive. Like you told me on that first phone call, you want to be top five. You know, right now we need to make X adjustments to what we're doing to get to that goal. And when both minds are kind of thinking that and visualizing that from the very beginning, I just find that it usually always happens. Like my athletes hit that exact number, you know, whether it's two weeks before or it's like, the day before the show, we always hit that goal. I mean, I can't really think of many situations that haven't where, you know, both parties are matching effort. Mm -hmm. I will give that caveat because, you know, if they're cheating on their diet and doing different things, like, and they're not executing on the adjustments that I make and we're not working together or they're not checking in every week, then that's a different story. But I feel like if we both are matching efforts, like, we're going to get to where we need to be because we set that expectation and we both know that that's what we need to do. Um, so my thoughts. Yeah, there. absolutely. Love it. All right. So with um, programs, timeline, expectations, aligned with goals, we talked about that mm -hmm. and just like desire and vision. Um, vision for longevity, I think is really key. Something that I've always wanted, like as part of, it's kind of my mission in like the whole prep life and glam girl and all of that. I just want people to have longevity in this sport and not to get burnt out and to have this enhance their life rather than, you know, be something that it's just like everyone dreads or everyone around them dreads when they do it type of thing. Um, I don't know about your thoughts there, but. Yeah, I, something I really appreciate about you as a coach and I've tried to implement it with my athletes as well as, when we're coming up to a show and then right after too, but even beforehand, you'll, you'll reach out and be like, Hey, be thinking about like, what do you want to do next? Like, what's your timeline next? And then we'll look at judges feedback and we'll be like, Hey, as soon as like, I think even on show day or even sometime that weekend, you'll be like, Hey, let's schedule a call. Let's talk about the plan going forward. And you're always thinking about the next plan and helping us frame our mindset towards, you know, recovery. And then what is our next goal? So how can we frame our reverse diet and our off season to, for the next goal? Or are we going to continue to compete? How can we bring, you know, recover from this show to do another show and what that looks like? And you're always thinking ahead, which oh, is great for long time and energy in the sport. It's great. It's so good. And you encourage us as coaches to do that as well. But I think that's really important, even with, you know, um, a lifestyle or improvement season, like always be thinking ahead. Once you reach that goal, what's your next goal and how can you grow within the sport and stuff? And um, I like that you talked about next step goals. I think I think that's just important. It's an important conversation to always have like a plan A, a plan B. Um, and like you said, even if they're not going to compete, you know, just talking about getting the athlete their reverse, you know, the week before the show and you've already had that conversation like, okay, after the show, this is what it's going to look like because I've been that person that's gained 15 pounds the next day. I had zero plan for what I was going to do. Like I, I hit this goal. I got nationally qualified. I did my first figure show. And now like, what am I supposed to do? You know, especially when you're on a restrictive diet, like, which we don't do really. Um, but if you are, and you're that person, like you can feel so lost if you don't have direction as to where you're going to go. Um, so yeah, I just think it's an important step. And even like you said, even if they're not going to compete ever again, like if it was just like a bucket list thing, it's important to be like, okay, we need to spend like two to three months of, you know, reversing out of the show and making sure we have a, a solution to that goal. So good. point. I, there. Think I, a good, I think a good green flag to even have when you're picking a coach or when you're looking at hiring a coach is, are they already talking about your reverse diet from the start? 
and, yeah. and I'll be encouraging yeah. you, hey, let's let's work out your timeline so that you make sure you have some extra weeks of coaching after the show or you will get a plan after the show because reverse dieting might be the hardest part of prep. That might just be me, yeah. but I think a no, big thing about it, is, it is, is expectation and setting up the yeah. athlete to think, hey, you are not done <laughs> with competition mode. Like, you need to still be training like an athlete, recovering like an athlete, eating on your prep diet. I mean, you told me one time that you give it about two months. I don't know if that was me personally or across the board, if that's how long it takes, but it really helped my perspective because I was getting a little annoyed <laughs> that <laughs> I was still dieting like a month after the show. And you were like, no, it actually yeah. takes about two months to get back up to baseline in a healthy way. Um, it could yeah. take more for you even. And that yeah. really, change my perspective like wow this takes a lot longer I mean honestly you've been dieting for this long you can't just expect to bounce back in a couple of weeks so I think yeah your metabolism just naturally down regulates with mm -hmm. all the extra movement you have to like get those adaptations you have to slowly get rid of those you know because you've hit like your highest cardio your lowest calories probably to get that lean and it's, I mean, for some people that, you know, if they are already on high calories going into the show, it's a little bit different story. You know, their ghrelin might not be as high as a competitor, but most competitors, when you're not, when you don't have body fat, you don't have a lot of leptin being produced because leptin is produced by body fat and that's your satiety hormone. So until you get a little bit more body fat on your, on your frame, you're not going to feel the leptin and the satiety. And it's just a weird feeling of like, you don't have control with the eating. Like, it's just like, you're never full and it can be a slippery slope. So I think that's a good thing to point out. And definitely like your hormones and everything get a little bit better regulated after two months. Yeah. Um, okay. So your coach, it would be a good green flag if they take the time to teach you the tools needed to be successful, provide feedback on form, tracking, meal prepping, et cetera. So I know something that I've changed recently, like with my athletes is I, I felt like the thing that was lacking was I felt like I did a good job of just when somebody's in prep and they're leaning out, like I'm really like on top of like giving like specific feedback, but I was finding as a coach, like until recently that I was kind of lost in terms of like, cause it's kind of defeating, you know, for the athlete, like when they're gaining weight and it's like, it's hard to track like what actually matters in the improvement season until I started tracking their weights that they're lifting and getting feedback on their lifts and like having weekly communication being focused on the lifts through like Google tracking sheets. So I can see in real time, like how many improvements they've made on their lifts, like where they're progressing. Because before we'd give up, like I would give them a, a workout plan, but like, I didn't know how much weight they were lifting. Like if they had a gym that they needed to make like different modifications and things. And so now I feel like it just starts that conversation every week when I go over their check-in and I go over their workout sheet and their Google sheet tracker, like, and I look at their weights and I give them feedback and I highlight things. And I just feel like for me, like that's helped me help my improvement season athletes to have like more hands-on like tracking, because like I said, I feel like I do a good job of, you know, really like getting somebody to a contest, but it's like afterwards, it's like, both parties have like a little bit of a struggle there, like with, you know, things that in general, I don't know if that's making sense, but totally, it's totally making sense. I think it's another level of online coaching because if you have a trainer, they're there with you in person. And the difference is they're focusing all of their attention on you watching your form, making sure you're taking it to muscle failure or whatever your goal is, correcting, you know, mind muscle connection, making sure you're doing it correctly and pushing yourself to your limit. But I think of an online coach as more of, they're almost like the manager of your fitness. So there, there's yeah. so much more to an online coach. It's not less, it's more when you hire a coach versus a personal trainer gives you their hour. That's one hour. Maybe you meet with them two or three times a week. That's one hour, right? You have a coach, they're, they're kind of managing your entire journey and they're taking in so many different things and they're hands-on in so many different ways. But just having that extra, like tracking the weights of the workouts helps mm -hmm. you just 
be more of a hands-on coach as an online coach. And I, I think, I don't know of a lot of online coaches that do that, but I think it's, it, it really sets you apart. It makes you like an elite coach to have that where you're tracking mm -hmm. our weights and things in the off season. Well, thank you. Yeah. I, I also encourage people to send videos of their form too. Just if I can't be with them, I, if they're just not sure, or they're like, man, I just am not getting good engagement when I'm doing this. So I'll have them send me a video of their form and I'll send a loom fit feedback video, just mm -hmm. similar to like, if they were in prep and they, you know, weren't like posing with me online, like via FaceTime or zoom, like they just want to send me a video and I would like break down their form and technique and they're posing in the improvement season, you know, we want to be focused on that goal of like lifting weights and having that. And even just even during prep as well, like I'm going to, you know, look at someone's feedback video and things like that if, if they have questions. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think just always trying to find a level of communication that is beyond just like typing on a computer, I think is the important, like, like that's one thing that you have to be really creative with how you create a connection with your clients. And that's why I've always included like the optional accountability call. If people need to talk to me, I want them to be able to talk to me about problems or issues or goals or excitement, whatever it is. Like I want them to have access to me. And that's why I also like doing EMGs, you know, like I offer that to an athlete like once a year, just because it's good for me to see like, what different exercises maybe engage their muscle groups compared to another person and just having that hands-on work in the lab. I think, you know, the online coach hopefully isn't the death of the practitioner. Like we still need to be like, you know, working our craft in person. Like you do it all the time because you're working with people one-on-one, -on -one, but I don't as much. And so I th just think it's good to get in there every once in a while and, you know, give somebody an analysis of like, a glute workout and see like on the EMG, like how much this is working and engaging. And I think any level you can give of communication, which is why I definitely started doing videos to every single check-in because I want them to see my face. So my body language, I want them to hear the inflection in my voice, you know, a lot can get lost in just like a typed email. So. Mm -hmm. It can be overwhelming too, especially if you have a lot of feedback. If you as an athlete are really yeah. busy and you see your reply and it's like paragraphs versus yeah. often I'm like driving to work and I'm like, oh, Amy got back to my check-in. Let me just listen to it in the car. You know what I mean? So that's, yeah. that's really good. Yeah. Well, and it also, I mean, it's, it saves time on both people's ends, I think, because if I were to type, spend the time typing, it actually takes me longer than if I just send a five minute video. Mm -hmm. um, and then I feel like I can get more, more things accomplished anyways. So yeah, totally. So we talked all about like coaching, coaching skills, all those things. I think this, I think this might be the last one, but this green flag, this, this is a huge one to look for. They refer you out. So they, yes. they have other professionals that they refer you out to if it's beyond their scope of practice. We have a scope Absolutely. of practice and we are good at coaching within those boundary lines, but yep. you know, we're not like doctors. We don't, we're not, you know, we're not chiropractors. We're not, you know, physical therapists. We're not, you know, we're not hormone specialists. Some coaches might be all that, but um, you definitely want someone who has people to refer you out to and is willing to do that when it's your health on the line. Cause this is a sport. It's not just yeah. general health and fitness. So what are your yeah, thoughts? And I mean, I think just taking the ego out of it too, and just recognizing like something isn't your niche. Um, not just for like, okay, so examples of people that I refer out is like, if somebody has eating disordered behaviors, like I'm going to, you know, direct them to a mental health specialist that can help them with that. Um, you know, if people have needs that are medical, then we're going to refer to them to a doctor. If they have an injury, referring them to PT, those are all things that are great resources. But I think also like just considering the evolution of the athlete and in their best interest. So I'm going to take my um, former client Karina, as an example, she originally wanted to do bikini and she did very well at it. And then she, we moved her to figure. And then we realized like she wanted to be pro and we felt like fitness was her best move to get there. So I referred her to Whitney Jones because 
I was like, Karina, I don't know how to do choreography and how to train you to do this routine. My specialty is bikini. Mm -hmm. You know, like if you were going to become a bikini athlete, then I would absolutely keep training you. But like we kind of had that conversation like, you know, this is probably in your best interest that I refer you to her as a professional fitness, Mm -hmm. you know, coach. And I feel totally good about that. Like, I mean, we still communicate, like I, I coached her for her pro debut and stuff like that, but eventually like she just, she needs to have like a fitness coach, you know what I mean? But like, we have a great relationship and we we always talk about whatever, but I just think it's really important that you think about like different things. Um, like if your client wants to be a bodybuilder, then like they need to probably have a bodybuilding coach, not a bikini coach, (laughs) you know? Um, and I mean, I've coached a, enough figure and I've been a figure athlete myself. Like I can coach figure I've coached enough wellness, you know, there's certain things that like are within the parameters, but you know, I just always want to refer people and put them in the best situation. And, um, you know, sometimes, you know, like that, we just have to take our egos out of it and be like, okay, we aren't the best fit for you. Um, and yeah. I think that that can happen even on interviews, like if you're talking to a new prospect, because sometimes like personalities just don't mesh and you want it to be a win for both people. And my core value is that I keep my roster small. I've always been like that. My number one thing is that I want my clients to have the concierge service. So I don't care. And this is going to happen a lot. I'm going to lose a lot of money and it doesn't bother me at all because this is my passion. But like, I will go to a national show if I have one athlete because I want to be there for them. Like if they have the possibility to go pro, like I just feel like it's important for me to be there. And I've always had a small team. I always keep my roster small. Um, Like, you know, from when we kind of talked, like there's been times where I just limit my roster um, because we talked about that when you were first like signing on and I was like, okay, I have a spot, you know, but like I really do want to make sure that I'm giving – my athletes that I have now, the time they deserve. Um, so I'm never going to be that coach that does 25 check-ins a day, you know, having a hundred plus people because there's just, you can only do so much and like, you don't want to spread yourself thin because then you're just watering down your product and the quality of it. So for me, it's like a white glove service. I want to be there. I want to give athletes the opportunity, which is why I still do team shows. Like, So even like first timers can have their coach at a show if they pick the team show. And I I let people know that in advance and, you know, we can definitely do it long distance. That's not an issue. And we can do national shows, long distance and things like that. But it's just, I want them to feel like they have all of me. And so I guess that's like my biggest core value when it comes to this thing is that I'm sharing my passion with other people that I'm passing that on that love and that joy that it's brought me, like I want to bring that to other people and I want them to feel special. And so that's kind of where my heart is with the whole thing. But yeah, I love that. And I think that that is, has such a big impact on the longevity of the sport for a lot of these athletes. We have a certain, when we start, when we first start, we have a certain like picture in our mind of what it's going to be like and often it it's way harder and way less glamorous than we can but if we can somehow enjoy the process honestly I did this as a bucket list when I signed up coaching with you I had done CrossFit competitions I had done 5k races I had done powerlifting and strongman bodybuilding was next on my bucket list and when I started coaching with you I enjoyed my experience so much that I was like I'm going to keep going and so you you are so good at making the experience enjoyable for the athlete, even when it's really hard. But we feel really, we do feel really like we feel like rock stars. We literally feel like rock stars. And you've put so much effort into that. I mean, some of us are going to go pro, right? But even if we go pro, we probably won't be Miss Olympia because there's one Miss Olympia a year. And that takes a lot to be Miss Olympia, right? So it's like, you can only, you do, you always want to be getting better and improving in the sport, but if you're not enjoying it, the payback for it is pretty low. So you want to be enjoying your experience for longevity and having fun at those local shows. Some of those local shows were the best experiences I've ever had. 
do uh -huh. it shoots together, going out to dinner together, you know, team check-ins, team, like we make it such a big deal. It's like the red carpet experience. We feel like rock stars. Oh, uh -huh. good. Got a job yeah. I think that's really uh -huh. important. Just have fun with it. Yeah. I just want people to feel like queen for a day because I mean, I never had that community and that's why I wanted to build. And especially with women, it's like, I just wanted it to be female owned and operated only and just um, women like sharing these experiences with each other and getting to know each other, creating bonds for a lifetime. You know, there's people that go their separate ways and they're still like the original way they met is like through Glam Girl and they're like best friends and they may not even be training with our team. They may not be training for a competition, but like they're great friends and seeing that makes me so happy. And yeah. And I mean, I even see like coaches that I've mentored, like helping other people and like, you know, thriving in their business. Cause our business is like in the fitness industry. It's very much like, you know, like everybody kind of has their brand and things like that, but it's like, it feels good to me that like they're also passing that on to other people and they're just like extending that even if they're not even part of our team anymore. It's like, it makes me happy to know that like people are looking first and foremost for people's health and well being, and like the competing part. Yeah. Like, trust me, I am the most competitive person there is like, I want to win more than probably the athlete does. Um, and so I will do, you know, whatever it takes to like, make that happen but at the end of the day like you just have to like enjoy everything about it like the people you meet and the people you're around and I don't know I'll, I'm kind of rambling now it. but <laughs> anyway <laughs> I love it so I think that kind of concludes this episode don't you think so what do you guys think put in the comments what if we missed any green flags um and oh what you thought. If you have any questions for us, we're always open for questions about coaching, about green flags. If you have a scenario you want us to feed in on, go ahead and post yeah. it in the comments. We're always up for more questions too. Absolutely. Yeah. And you can find us on Instagram at Prep Life Podcast or at Glam Girl Bikini. Feel free to shoot us a DM. If you like the episode, feel free to screenshot it, tag us on your story. Let us know what you thought of it in this podcasting world, it's really hard to get feedback other than, you know, if you are commenting, if you're watching on YouTube, you can easily comment. Um, but be sure to leave a rating or review. If you found value in this episode, I really, I get asked about ads all the time, like almost every week. Um, but I will keep this ad free just because to me, like, I want to, I want to just share my knowledge. I want to share like my failures, my, like whatever it is that if somebody can learn from it and do better the next time, like that's what this podcast is all about. And I just, if you feel it in your heart to kind of pay it forward so that someone else that might be interested in the same topics, uh, it just helps the algorithm. If you do leave a rating or review on, especially on Apple podcasts. So feel free to do so. And if you would like to reach out about coaching, you can go to glamgirlbikini.com and hit the get started button. Thanks for listening guys. <laughs>